Um, sorry, that was just me for backup. As long as we're good to go, do I need to reintroduce myself or are we okay? Fine. Good. Um, and so I worked exclusively with children for the first 10 years, uh, over the first um, half of my career. Um, and then I became a mom and right, then life changes and everything changes. Um, and I really felt more called towards working with the women, the, the mothers, the families. Um, hence why I went back and got um, some extra classes and, and just working on just relationships and family dynamics. I find it pretty fascinating. Um, so today we're going to be talking about harmony at home. And we, while I wish, and I hope for you and I hope for my own family, uh, that it was 100% harmony and life was amazing all day long, every day. The reality is there are big emotions inside these tiny little bodies and it's really hard. Um, and we want to give them the best life possible, but also we're human. And so hopefully right now, mom, I'd love you to take a big deep breath and say like, I'm doing the best I can. And that's enough. And you're doing a great job with it. So just honoring who you are and where you are in your season of life. Um, I'm meeting you there and saying, this is awesome, but this is also crazy, crazy hard. And we want to do the best job we can. Um, so as we go here, I always like to start with this um, because right when I'm at the grocery store and my child's in the cart and I see um, the shouting or the tears or someone's angry, there's usually we have to look at the whole context of it, right? Maybe she didn't get to wear the purple shirt she wanted to today because it was in the laundry and she had to wear the yellow shirt. Or there was a family fight this morning because we missed the bus. Or there's family pressure because dad is stressed at work and it's trickling down to the kids or mom's stressed at work and it's trickling down. There's all these other moving pieces. Um, so I think this is a helpful just image to start with um, of what we see but then also the, the context of it. Um, if I could change this picture, if I could do one thing, I would make the little lobster at the bottom, the culture one, a lot bigger. Because here in Singapore, right? Is that the truth? In Singapore, right? Every single minute, I'm talking to someone else from another country. And I always want to take that into account when I'm talking to them because their norm is, is just going to be inherently different than my norm. Even if they're from the same town I'm from, their, their family culture just might be different. So taking all those things into consideration, I think is important as we, we look at every, my behaviors, your behaviors, Johanna, and our children's behaviors as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is from Conscious Discipline. Shout out. I'm not getting paid to do this, but Conscious Discipline is great. I would follow them on Instagram or social media. Um, a lot of the stuff you're going to see today is from there. They make up, they put out great books. There's great literature from them. So shout out to Conscious Discipline. It's a great program. Um, and I, I really value what they have to say in their research. So we're going to look at this. Um, this is the brain. This is my brain. This is your child's brain, your brain. Um, so when our kids are born, they only come with a survival state. And their, their brain is saying always, am I safe? Am I unsafe? Um, so that's really all they've got going on. If you have a newborn baby right now, that's kind of all they're thinking, right? If they're cold, they're feeling I'm unsafe, they're going to cry out. By the age of about two, we start to see that emotional state come out. That means their limbic system has woken up um, and they go into a state of not just am I safe, but then they're able to cognitively ask themselves, you know, unconsciously, Am I loved? Do I feel emotionally safe in this environment? So that's why that, Johanna, if you've heard that term, like the terrible twos, that's because of this. It's because their, their emotional state is literally coming alive, coming awake. Um, and then about the age of 12 and 13, right? When like puberty hits, we start to see those executive functioning skills come out. So we can think of our brain developing from low to high and from back to front. Um, good news and bad news. Um, so the brain develops from bottom to top and back to front. The front, which is the last place to ever develop in our brain, is where all our executive functioning skills live, mm -hmm. which is which is great to know. But also our brain doesn't fully develop until for females about the age of 28 and wow. for men, it's about the age of 30. And if you have ADHD, research shares that it's actually two years later. So if we're frustrated with our four or seven or 10 year old for not having um, the attention span that we want them to have, it's because their brain literally isn't, isn't developed. So we, it's, it's hard to ask children to do things when their brain just isn't ready for it. And we can do some things along the way and we're gonna talk about those, um, but it, it, our brain isn't wired to do some of the things that society has expected of us. So. Hopefully this slide is building just some empathy to our children and it builds empathy every time I look at it. I'm thinking about my two kids at home, like 
I ask them to do something, but their brain literally isn't wired to do it yet. Um, so how to coach them along in that. So if you think about the brain, am I safe? That's the first question we ask ourselves. Then we can ask ourselves, am I loved? And then from there, it's what I can learn. So if your kid's feeling safe, there's a great opportunity to love them well. And then from them, then now they can learn a new skill or new, new activity. Okay, great. Amazing. Wow. I need some more empathy for my 19 year old. <laughs> he has great, his brain hasn't developed yet. You should, you should. <laughs> oh gosh, it's going to be a long ride. <laughs> <laughs> like from, they're better, they're, your son is better off right now than my two little kids because his brain's developed more. So that's good. But um, yeah, hopefully, I know you think I'm doing like a science lesson right now. I promise we're going to get to the nitty gritty of how to control that tantrum. But I feel like this builds a great foundation to build a place of empathy for what biologically is happening inside the brain. Cause it's just, it's a, it's a lot. Um, and they're just growing a ton. Um, so one more slide, I promise we're going to get to the nitty gritties, but to remember that mirror neurons are a thing. So mirror neurons were discovered in about the 1990s. So if you were born, I was born before 1990, there is no way my parents knew this information because it didn't exist yet. It wasn't discovered until the 1990s. And mirror neurons just means literally you're, you're copying what you see. So right now, right, I'm, I'm almost, I'm looking at Johanna right now. Like my body is mirroring her, right? If I sit up, you sit, our, our body is, is intended to mirror what we see. So children, um, mirror neurons develop just before a year old. So if I'm constantly yelling, guess what my kid's going to do? No. Right. They're not exactly going to be peaceful people. So what I do really, really matters, um, which is a good thing because I'm in control of me. I can't control them, but I can certainly control me or try to at least control me. Um, so mirror neurons exist. It's amazing. It's literally just it, 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 down to a cellular level. We're, we're mimicking what we see. So this is another kind of thing just to keep in the back of your head of what I'm doing. My children are going to mimic. Yeah. Um, so let's get down to it. All right. So how to help your child emotionally regulate. So I have great news and I have maybe some, some hard news to share. So a lot of it has to do, especially when they're little, like I would say like zero to five, zero to six has to do with really for Amanda to regulate myself first. I can't write, like, it's like when you're, when you're on an airplane and they say like, Make sure you're safe first before you help your, your buddy or your partner. I got to make sure I'm in a good place before I'm able to help my kids. Um, and when I go in to help my kids, and there's meltdowns all the time because they're two and six years old, and it's totally appropriate that they're having it. So if your child's having a meltdown every day, every week, every month, know that it's normal. There's nothing wrong with your child. It's totally normal for them to have a big emotion in a, in a tiny little body. Um, so when I go in to help, I mean, I use my children as an example, just because I'm literally living it. I lived it today. I lived it this morning, getting ready, getting out the door. I want to be authentic. I don't want to tell them everything's fine. Everything's great. Everything's amazing. When really it's not. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go in and be authentic. And I want to connect with myself first. So I have a minute, not even a minute, I would say a second where I'm thinking about myself and I'm being aware of my own triggers. So you can see on the screen, it says TICES. So TICES stands for thoughts, images, cognitions, emotions and my sensations. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is kind of just take a, take an inside pulse on like where I am. If I'm having my own little mini meltdown, I got to pull together before I can ever help them. I'm going to label my emotions and my sensations out loud, especially I would say under 10 years old, a hundred percent say out loud what's happening inside your body, because I'm talking directly to their limbic system, which is their emotional kind of headquarters. And I might say something like, I'm, one, I'm going to take a big deep breath, like, I feel really, really overwhelmed right now. And I'm making eye contact the whole time with them because I'm building connection, right? My goal is to build connection with these little humans. I'm going to practice taking a big deep breath in through my nose, out through my mouth. And it sounds dramatic, right? But if I don't teach them the skill, someone else is going to. And it might be the yeller on the bus. It might be the the, the kid on the playground that's having a huge melt and not able to control himself. I'm going to model for my children what I want them to do. And we know this research works. So I'm going to model for them. I feel really frustrated right now. I spilled my coffee all over my outfit and I have to leave the house in five minutes. <sighs> I've got this. So I'm going to model for them. I might even do havening. If you're not familiar with havening, it's literally stroking. You can practice it with me right now as you're all on, like your screens aren't showing. 
it's, and I'm pushing my, I'm pushing everything down. What this does is it decreases my level of cortisol. It's helping me connect with my body, right? That tice is that sensation. That's the, I'm calming my body right now. I'm decreasing the cortisol. I'm increasing um, my oxytocin, which is like my feel good, my dopamine, my feel good hormone. I'm calming myself down. And it's happened. I'm sure I see, Johanna, that you're drinking coffee right now. At some point in life, maybe it was with your 19-year-old or with your two-month-old, at some point, coffee spilled all over your outfit as you were like gunning to get out that door. And we all can remember it. I remember I drink a smoothie every morning. And that smoothie has gone all over me some mornings as the bus is literally coming and I have to get out the door. I feel super overwhelmed. I'm about to lose my mind. I'm going to try everything in my power to calm my body down. So these are some tools that can help you and also modeling for your child how to calm your body down. So we know when we breathe, two things happen. So we have our sympathetic nervous system and we have our parasympathetic nervous system. I'm going to direct everything in my power to my parasympathetic nervous system. And as you can see here, when we breathe, oxygen flows right there, flows right to our relaxation mode helps my heart beat slower. I can take a full breath in. My pupils are able to shrink a little bit, right? I don't, if it gets down to it, if you're living in the sympathetic nervous system all the time, you probably have some digestion issues. Even if you're living in such a high stress environment, the more I breathe and the breathe out loud through my nose, out through my mouth, I'm calming my body down. And this doesn't have to be a 10 minute ordeal. This is like the, the smoothie is all over me. I'm taking maybe 10 seconds because I don't have time. I literally don't have time. The bus is coming. I calm my body down. And the more I practice it, the better I get at it. 10 years ago, Amanda was not so great at this. Five years ago, Amanda was getting better at this. Today, I'm a little bit better at it. So now that I've calmed my body down, I'm good. Now I'm going to name it to tame it. And it's a cute little phrase you can remember with DNA, describing, naming, acknowledging. And I'm doing the whole thing with eye contact. So um, we can use the example of, um, and this has never happened at my house before, ever, <laughs> but my son's playing with Legos and Legos are basically king in our house. He loves them. It's a passion that is ab abundant. And my, my daughter came over and whacked them down and, and, she, you know, she's one too. So she, she did it very unfortunate for sure. Guess what happens? You can probably guess. Johanna, I, I'll let you guess what happens next. Big freak out of hitting, spitting, everything. <laughs> you destroyed my tower. Huge, big, big emotions. And my daughter, who doesn't know what's really going on, she was looking for connection. She's like, that's how you play. You whack things, you hit things, you throw things down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to physically hold her so she doesn't do it again. One. And I'm going to make eye contact with him and I'm going to look straight in his eyes. And I'm going to take my deep breath because right, I, I value harmony. I, I even named the title of this course this right. Like I value harmony a lot in my life. And so I want to make sure that we get back to that place of harmony so we can go back to having fun. I'm going to hold my daughter so she doesn't do it again. So I'm making a physical connection with her and I'm deep breathing so she can deep breathe. And I'm going to observe what I see. And this all happens in like, this is a 10 second thing. Again, this doesn't have to be an hour and a half situation. I'm going to describe what I saw. Wow. She knocked down the tower that you've been working on for a long time. I'm describing, I'm not saying you did something bad. You're a bad kid. This was a bad thing. I'm just describing what happened. If I don't have eye contact with him, I got to get that first. Oh, buddy, your face is like this. And your hands are like this. And guess what happens? If a kid's not looking at me, guess what the kid does? The kid starts to look, right? If I'm describing something, we're inherently going to watch it out of just pure curiosity. If I can get eye contact with him, then I'm in a better place. So I'm holding her still. I'm describing what I see. You seem frustrated. When they're older, you can ask, how are you feeling? But when they're little, we're giving them all the tools they need. This is what frustrated feels like, buddy. This is what it is. And you feel frustrated. You were hoping she was going to play with, you know, the Paw Patrol over here. You really hope that your tower was going to stay up. You're safe. And then I'm silent. This whole thing takes about maybe 30 seconds, maybe, maybe 20. I've done it in 10 seconds if I'm quick. I'm going to wait. 
I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to try to fix it for him. I'm not going to make up an excuse. I'm not going to do, I'm just going to be silent. And I would say 95% of the time, he, I'm still making a whole lot of eye contact. Yeah. He's calmed down because guess what? He feels emotionally safe. And most of the time, and I, again, 90, 95% of the time, mom, I'm going to refix it. Mom, can you help me refix it? Mom, actually let's play Paw Patrol now. Mom, and he's able to manage that feeling of disappointment and then he's able to fix it, right? Usually kids don't sit in feelings too long. They wait for that connection and then they feel emotionally safe and then they can do something about it or ask for help in doing something with it. So this can be helpful. Describe, name, acknowledge. I, and I'm happy to help fix, right? If after I've waited that silence, buddy, I'm here with you. I'm, uh, you're safe. We've got, we've got this. Then he's able to say, mom, can you help me fix it? Or mom, actually, can you play with this Lego with me? Or he's on to the next, right? Kids don't usually sit and sit and stir in things for hours, 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 unless they don't feel that connection. That mm -hmm. connection is so, so, so important. At that point, I, then I've got the two-year-old who's ready to knock down something else and I'm going to redirect. Mm -hmm. Hey, buddy, here's, I've got your pop, I've got your doll, I've got whatever. I'm going to redirect. And now she's physically safe. She's playing with the doll. He's over there and I'm going to push you this way or, or go play with you over here while he fixes his whatever he got destroyed in the moment. Mm -hmm. Amanda, is this a good time to uh, for moms to ask questions or parents? Let's do it. Has anybody got questions? This is a good time to ask. Um, what if he demands fix it, mom? Then let's do it. I am again, right when we go back to that brain model that I showed a minute ago, I want to feel, I want everyone at the table to feel safe. So I'm going to do, I'm going to set up my daughter here, sweetie, here is Paw Patrol, whatever else they're playing with. And I might even position my body so she doesn't have access. So in order to, to get to that, to, to knock down that tower again, she has to get through me. So I might sit to the side. So I have access to her whoop, just in case you want to do it again. And then I can help rebuild but I'm happy to always rebuild with him because I don't want to leave him, right? He feels emotionally safe. Then he feels loved. Then he can learn something, right? If I always go back to that base model, which which is, I think, a, a logical step, right? Moms can picture that in their head of like, is my kid feeling safe? Yep. All right, now he feels loved. Yep. Okay, now he can learn. He's going to learn to rebuild. He's going to learn to recreate. Okay, great. Any Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, then we move on. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to get rid of that chat. Oh, oh, how do you do the same thing with a younger child who doesn't completely understand all your words yet? Like they're under two example of a situation is he wants to hold something that isn't safe and it frustrates him. We're going to talk about, about bringing it back down to, to their layman's terms. Yeah. I have a two-year-old mom out there who just asked that such a good question. I'm going to layman's terms and I'm going to say, go relate everything back to safety. Um, we were even home this summer. We went back to visit the US and I was talking to my daughter and I must've been, I must've said the word safe 50 times in the afternoon that I was with my sister. And she even commented, she's like, Amanda, you talk about safety so much. I'm like, I know, I know. Yeah, then that was the end of the sentence. It was like, I talk about safety all the time because a two-year-old can understand safety. A two-year-old doesn't understand all my jargon about what I'm trying to explain, but they can understand this isn't safe. Mom needs to keep you. It's my job to keep you safe. And she might have a meltdown over it. And that's okay because I'm creating a healthy boundary. Um, one thing I don't have in here that, that I love doing with our two-year-old, she's having a meltdown over, and we can use that. Like she wants to hold a hot, um, a hot plate, right? She wants to hold the hot plate for whatever reason. And she's starting to have a huge, um, um, you know, I hold it, I hold it, I hold it it's not safe. Mom needs to keep you safe. This isn't safe. And I either will redirect, but you can hold this. And I might give her the plastic plate or, or the teddy bear or whatever other thing I have access to. If she's feeling really upset, I'll, especially I'd say the under two and under, but even three, four, two, I'll hold them. So I'll get her against my chest. So then her legs are, you know, on either side of me and I'm holding her. And again, going back to that breathing, I want to get back to her parasympathetic nervous system. So I'm going to take deep breaths in through my nose, out through my mouth. And I'm even breathing on her head, right? As I'm holding her. 
And because of mirror neurons, we know mirror neurons are in her and are in me. I'm modeling for her how I calm down because guess who always follows every time. And you know, what's funny now. So again, we have a two-year-old, she, she turned two in May. So I'm in the thick of it a hundred percent with all of you. Now she comes up to me. So if she's upset about something, she comes up to me, she goes like this, I love you. I love you because she's been coached now because I do it every single time to breathe. And I always say, I love you. I'm here with you. You are safe. And so she has now, it's actually quite, it's very cute, but she does it. I love you, mommy. I love you, mommy. Mm. I love you too, buddy. You're safe. And I'm going to go back to that safety piece every single time. Because if she feels safe, then she can feel loved. And then she has an ability to learn a new skill. Mm -hmm. Amanda, we have more questions, if you don't mind. Um, what do you do if there's already hitting, pinching happening, um, and both kids are screaming and crying? Mm -hmm. um, and you are triggered yourself because someone is getting hurt. How do you refrain from jumping in angrily and doing and going straight into admonishment? For sure. That has never happened in our house ever. <laughs> For sure. I mean, yeah, it happens. I again, the two and the six year old. Yeah, it happens. And also, right. I've had a long day too. And it always happens after dinner or when it's like everyone's tired or, Right. I just got a call about a client and, and I'm my head's there instead of, of being present for sure. Know that that's again, totally normal. And it's a, it, it happens. So what I'm going to do again, I'm going to go back to my Tyses. I wrote it in there earlier, my thoughts, my images, cognitions, emotions, sensation. I'm going to, and I sometimes will do this. Like I'll literally put my hand on my heart and breathe in and I'll even touch my nose and it looks ugly, right? I'm breathing in through my nose. It took about four seconds. Everyone's screaming. They're, the house is literally on fire. I'm going to go to whoever's physically not safe. If someone's physically hurt, I'm probably going to tend to them first. And I'm going to hold that person. So again, they're, they're mirroring my thoughts. You're safe. Mom's here. I've got you. I have totally got you. And then I'm going to make eye contact with the other one. Hey, buddy, you hit her. That hurt her feelings. She's upset. Look at her face. Her face. How does her face feel? And I'm going to try to be coaching both of them and coaching myself. Mom's worried about everyone's safety here. I'm going to always bring it back to safety a hundred, a thousand times over to make sure everybody's safe. Now, the way to avoid those, because there's hitting and punching and kicking and yelling and screaming, it happens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to practice that skill outside of that moment. So after the kids go to bed and I'm thinking about my day, about life, work, marriage, whatever. What can I do different for tomorrow? Okay, at a time when everyone's calm, at the breakfast table is a great place, right? The kids are having breakfast. I like to read them a book in the morning. I might, one, choose a book that talks about emotions and feelings, but two, I might practice that skill. Hey, when you feel frustrated, what can we do? Mom, I can ask you because I want the toy too. I want to ride the track. We have a play tractor in our house that's a big, it's a, it's a favorite. And there's a car too that's a big favorite in our house right now, the, the toy of the day. And they both fight over it because they both want it at the same time. Hmm, what can we do this afternoon when both people want it? And I'll talk to them about it. And they, most of the time, honestly, come up with a great idea. Or your child one goes first, then two, and child two goes first, second. Okay. And then after five minutes, we'll switch. That's a great idea, guys. I'm excited to try that this afternoon. I'm empowering them for yeah. them to think of the answer. Mm -hmm. Another question is, is there a way to correct the behavior of the younger child that is under two, uh, for example, to try explaining that her brother was working on it and she can play with him in an another way? For sure. Oh my gosh. Yes. Cause I'll talk to the, uh, the oldest one's a boy and the youngest one's a girl. And even what it doesn't even really matter the gender, but I'll talk to my daughter and say like Weston, uh, my child's, ha um, you know, brother's happy with playing you have a choice to either play gentle show me your gentle hands and gentle and I'll give her we have me, um, mega blocks is that a thing here mega blocks they're like big big Legos she, I'll I'll bring her let her, her mega blocks in while he's doing Legos and Maggie um sweetie we're gonna practice these first and then we can play with those because I'm constantly wanting to coach her in how to be appropriate with them not no you can't you shouldn't you won't you don't the shame and blame game was something of another generation. We do not do blame and shame here. What we can do is coaching you and what I want you to see for the next time in acknowledging emotions. 
Mm-hmm. Kids can understand, right? Like my two-year-old, I'll have her describe what she sees in my son if he's upset. What does his face look like? Sad. Mm-hmm. He looks sad. Also on our fridge, this is a side note, but on our fridge, there's a, um, I have a chart. You can find it on Pinterest. You can find it. You just Google um, like a emotions chart and I'll go over and it, it's a pic, they're all cartoons, but it's like someone happy, sad, angry, in the first year of life, there's those primary emotions. It's fear, anger, sadness, joy, and interest. Those are the five emotions you're kind of like, by the time you're a year old, you're kind of, you kind of have. And I'll describe them to her and I'll say like, which one is, which one is, are you today? And she can show me. So then I'm ha- practicing her showing or, you know, identifying the emotion of the, of the other child. Cause it helps build that skill of empathy, which they don't have because they're not old enough to have empathy. Okay. I think we can move on. Great. Um, all right. So one, again, I'm going to, I'm doing a lot of repeating, but it's just, I, yeah, I think it's important. You've got to be regulated. And if you're not regulated, we're going to talk about kind of what to do about that in a bit, but try to regulate yourself and know your triggers. That's a huge one. A lot of women come in here and they're like, I just don't know my triggers. And so we spend a lot of time. So I love working with women because adults are are more obviously self-aware and they're able to see like, I'm always triggered at five o'clock at night. Okay. How can I be proactive in that? I know five o'clock is a really hard hour for our family. I'm going to, the night before, I'm going to plan out two games that they can choose to play with or whatever, it, whatever it might be. So, um, but now that I'm regulated, now I can help them, right? Like always, right. Put on your face mask first before you help somebody else. So I'm going to break it down. I'm going to give them choices. Okay. So someone's having a meltdown. What choice do you have? Would you like to do um, the Daniel Tiger game or would you like to do a twister? You know, giving, giving options because that is perceived power. And anytime I can give my kids perceived power, sign me up. I love giving perceived power. It's amazing what it does for them. Again, I'm going to relate it back to safety. I'm going to reflect on it. What would happen if, um, if, if your brother keeps crying? uh, stay sad. He would stay sad. We want, we want him to feel happy. How can we help him? We're again, like building that, that mentality of like being on a team. I'm going to clarify, right. When the kids are running out the door and and I'm feeling overwhelmed because I've got that eight o'clock meeting and someone's going to miss the bus. What did you hear me say? Okay. When we go outside, your shoes are waiting for you. You can choose to put your shoes on first or your belt on first. I'm going to give them some choices and what they choose to do, but I'm also going to reflect, hey, what did you hear me say? I'm going to apply it then. Hey, it seems like you chose to put your shoes on first and then your belt. Great. And then with managing their emotions, right? I'm going to, I'm going to come to them with empathy. You were, when my son's tower got knocked down, you were really hoping that that would stay up and it got knocked down. That is really hard. Because there's nothing worse. And I remember from as being a child and even remember, I can acknowledge it now when someone's like, right, Johanna, if you come in the door and you're like to your husband, oh my gosh, I had a really, really hard day. Oh, this happened, this happened. And your, your husband's like, well, get over it. It's fine. How would you react? Yeah, that's not cool. No, right? And so as an adult, if I don't want that, I'm not going to give it to my kids. So I want to meet them. Right. If, if I, if my husband's comes through the door, if my kids are coming through the door and there's disappointment, there's frustration, there's anger, I'm going to just meet them in it and say, that really stinks, man. I'm so sorry that that happened. You didn't get to get to sit next to Johnny on the bus. The auntie wanted you to sit with Billy, man, that really, that's hard. You really wanted to sit next to him. It means one eye contact, always, always eye contact. I'm not on my phone saying that sucks, buddy. Bye. Right. that then, then what eventually is going to happen is he's not going to share it with me. There are people in my life personally, and I'm sure you can say the same, Johanna, where you've gone and you've given out that bit of like, you've, you've shared information, you've disclosed, you've been vulnerable and said, Hey, this has been hard today. And someone has rejected you. Yeah. Guess who you're not going back to mm-hmm. that person. I'm not going to go back to them. It's not hard to say, wow, you were really hoping for that's hard. That didn't happen. Just meet them there. Yeah. A lot of times they don't, just like in our life, and especially as women, I don't want anybody to fix it that I had a hard day. I mean, it'd be great if they did, but that's not life. I had a really hard day. My husband's like, man, that's rough. I'm really sorry that happened. It's not his fault, but he's not trying to fix it. Just meeting where I am. Yeah. 
Amazing. We have another question. Um, I took my very petite toddler to a play date recently and the older, much bigger toddler instantly shoved him, causing him to fall and cry. Mm. What? How can I deal with this situation? On the one hand, it feels like standard toddler behavior on the part of the shover, but will such incidents harm my child's confidence? He's very petite and I don't want him to feel bullied. Really valid and kudos to you, mom. I, I agree. You're right. If this happens every second of every day, yeah, that could eventually he's gonna right learn the skill, mirror neurons, he's gonna learn the skill, he's gonna push back, or mm -hmm. he might push back to the brother or a teacher or a whoever stranger, who knows. So yeah, we do want to acknowledge that's not to the to the older brother, that's not safe. And to the little one, my job is to keep you safe. We use gentle bodies. And then at a time that nobody's hitting each other, I'm going to practice gentle bodies. I'm going to, this is what a gentle body looks like. This is what it looks like to borrow and share a toy. I'm going to model the behaviors I want to see, right? Because we all love control. I'm totally, totally guilty of it. I want to control their emotions and I can't, or their, their physical behaviors. I can't, but what I can do is coach them in what society or what I want them to see. I want them to see gentle bodies all the time. My two-year-old totally will hit my six-year-old because she doesn't have that, the skill of communication yet because she's two. She can't articulate herself like a six-year-old can. So she has pushed him before. And so I'm, I'm living it. Um, and it's super annoying. One, because I don't want him to get hurt now over a little guy. But even if one was bigger, one was smaller, we use gentle bodies in our house. So every morning, guess what we have now started as our as a morning mantra of like, we use gentle bodies. Can I borrow your fork? <gasps> Thank you. And then I'm making eye contact. My smile's big. Oh, you share with mommy. Thank you so much. I'm modeling, modeling, modeling what I want to see because eventually it's going to kick in. And we're going to talk about repetition in a, in a minute. But the more I repeat what I want to see, the more likely they are to do it. I think the question in this instance was, um, this mom, it's not her own toddler who shoved her mm -hmm. boy. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else on the playground or on a play date. And this is where we come into the situation where, you know, this is not my child. What can I do to, you know, uh, how are other people going to perceive me if I reprimand uh, somebody else's child kind of thing? Or what do you have to, to offer here? I've lived that. And I, I, I'm so sorry to the mom that I, I misheard your answer. I'm terribly sorry. Question. I'm sorry. And that's when I'm going to set firm boundaries for our family, right? I protect my kid. And that doesn't mean I have to do it in a mean or nasty way, but I'm going to set boundaries. Hey, don't, um, we're going to keep our hands to ourselves. I'm going to ask that you keep your hands to yourself and she, or he's going to keep his hands to himself. Um, we use gentle bodies in our house. And then I'm going to redirect and I'm going to choose to play with somebody else. If you're going to do that, that's on you, but I'm not going to allow my child right from a safety perspective. I'm not going to let my child go back into a fire. I'm going to redirect. Hey, you know what? Actually, we're going to play over here on this slide. Let's go. Come on, buddy. And we're going to redirect. I won't go back into the fire. Mm -mm. But also if it happens over and over again, I'm not opposed to, and in a loving, gentle way, I'm going to go back to that mom and say, Hey, actually, um, your brother or your, um, your son, your daughter, um, pushed my daughter. Um, and I know this is all a learning environment and this is a great place to practice new skills, but just to make you aware of it, I just want everybody to be safe mm -hmm. and coming at it from a place of love, not a place of judgment, because eventually it's going to be my kid that's probably hit somebody. So I'm yeah. going to be on the other end of it. And I will even say that like, you know, it was my kid last week. It's your kid this week. And I'm so sorry, but would you just be mindful of your child? Because uh, she fell down and she got hurt. And I want everybody to be safe. Mm. That's probably okay. what I'd say. Good. Um, moving on. Beautiful. I love the questions. I think they're really good ones. And it's uh, hard in the moment because you're right. There's a, I'm totally a mama bear. I don't want anybody touching my kid and it's happened, but I know on the other end, I'm going to be on the receiving end of it at some point, or, you know, the giving part of it, or it's my kid that's hit somebody and you're like, oh my gosh, I can never come back to this playground. This is so embarrassing. But a playground is a time where people are trying out new skills. So it, it happens, unfortunately. Um, I always put this in slides when I talk to parents and families, um, or even I did a, I did a marriage um, little seminar yesterday um, for a group of families. Um, so when we look at the way we communicate, 7% um, is is the words we say 38% almost almost 40% is the tone and the voice we're speaking and 55% is, is our body language 
So I use this as an example. Every morning I say the same exact thing to my kids. They come out of their room or I get them from their, their crib. Good morning. I'm so glad. And I, my hands are big because I want to make myself big. I want to know, be known as a protective adult person in their life. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. I missed you when you were sleeping. I love you. And then can I have a hug? And I go, when I ask them, but I go in and I, and I hold them and then I wait for them to release. I'll keep holding, I'll hold them for five minutes if they let me, good Lord. And then I let them release. But the way that my body enters, the way they, they come in the, in the morning sets us up for the day. So I want to make sure my body's open. I want to make sure my tone of voice is, is a happy one. If they found me in the morning and it was like, Hey, I'm glad you're here. Here's dinner or here's breakfast. It's like, <laughs> Mom didn't have a good sleep. Or even like that mom who just asked the question about the kid on the on the playground. If I go up to a parent and I say, hey, your kid pushed my kid, stop it. Oh, oh man, that I'm scared. I'm scared even saying it out loud, right? Our tone and our body language matter way more than actually what we say. So I want to make sure that I have a, a, a pleasant um, body and my tone of language is, is going to be appropriate um, to meet my kids or meet the stranger on the playground, whatever, where they are. So when we're talking to our kids, being mindful of those things could be helpful um, and talking to our spouse too. I just did that, I did that marriage conference yesterday and yeah, the way we speak to our, our spouse matters a ton. This exact slide, I literally just copy and pasted it. Yeah. It matters how we talk. Even Johanna, when you found me this morning or we, we connected, it was like, Hey, good morning. I'm really glad you're here. Right. It wasn't like, oh, I'm glad to be on this call, Johanna. It's like, Oh, Amanda needs a nap or like she needs coffee or something. Right. Like. It matters the way we speak and how we say it. Um, when we talk about consequences and punishment, I think is like an old school term. And I know people, you know, I grew up with the word punishment for sure. We want to think about consequences um, versus punishment. Um, so natural consequences, right? That's if I if my shoes untied, I'm going to fall. If I don't eat something, my belly's probably going to hurt. Um, if I'm keep pushing, if I, Johanna, every time I saw you, I pushed you, you probably wouldn't get close to me, right? It's just a natural consequence that, that happens. So we want to go to logical ones. I want it to be related. Um, at the bottom of the screen, I said um, food is, and I know I definitely um, have done this before in the past where we have like this amazing dessert and the kids are acting, a, a, you know, acting crazy. And I'm like, you know, no dessert. And after I went back and thought about it, it's like, what did dessert have to do with you not sitting in your seat? Like literally nothing. Yeah. And if we say like, you know, this weekend, I'm not going to let you have a play date with Johnny. You're not allowed to have a sleepover on Saturday night with mommy and her, you know, whatever, mommy and daddy in the room, whatever it is. The kid, by the time it happens, has no recollection of it. Not one single thing. So we want to make them related. Like as soon as the thing happens, the consequence goes with it. So uh, my daughter knocking over my son's toys. Well, the consequence is you don't get to play with those toys anymore. We're going to have to practice that skill and we're going to try again tomorrow. But right now here, you're mega blocks and you can choose to play with these or the doll or, mm -hmm. the or whatever, some other thing. I want them to be related side by side. So there's a cause, there's an effect that happens with it. I want it to be respectful. I'm not going to shame them. You are bad. You did something wrong. That leads to shame and blame. And I, if I don't see it in my office every single hour of every single day, people are coming in with a ton of shame and blame as foundational feelings. And we're working to change them and shape them into feelings of, of opposite. So yeah. we don't, there's just, there's no need for the shame and blame game. It's over. It's done with. We'll leave it in the 1950s. We want it to be reasonable, right? Like I'm not throwing the Legos out the window because <laughs> my daughter knocked them over, right? Like we want to be rational with it, right? Like, yeah, I think that kind of goes. And empathy. I always want to end in empathy, right? I don't need to have some long drawn out saga of, of this whole lecture of why you can't play with Legos. It's just like short, sweet. Hey, you wanted to play with Legos, but you're knocking him down. It's not safe. And our, our son is, is really, he wants to play with them and, and, and it's okay that he wants to build a tower. You have a choice over here or the choice over there but I'm coming back with empathy. I love you. I care for you. And I want everybody to be safe here. So just some things to think about as you're thinking about like how to discipline, because I'm a huge fan of discipline. Good Lord. And I also want my kids to know that there's consequences, right? If I didn't show up for this today, Johanna, you wouldn't exactly be knocking at my door. Like can't wait to have Amanda back, right? There's a consequence to my action. 
right? If I don't show up, it's not going to go over well. If I show up, then yeah, then I can build a new relationship. I can grow um, in both our, our practices. Mm-hmm. So there's consequences to every single action. Um, so here are some just like fun, easy, I don't say fun, easier ways to, to help our kids get the skills we want them to have. I'm always thinking about what's next. I'm being proactive and I want to be positive about it. If I'm beating them down, I'm telling them, you can't, you won't, you shouldn't. Guess who's not going to come back to me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That means when they're 18 years old and they've failed their math test, guess who they're not going to tell? Because I'm scared. And that is not what I want in our family. That doesn't help anybody. So we can play games. So this is a, a really cool statistic. So um, there is um, a doctor named Karen Purvis. She, she since passed away, but she did a lot of research and she found out that in order to learn a new skill for children and really for, for adults too, but we're talking about children here, it takes 400 repetitions to learn a new, to have a new synaptic connection inside our brain. A synaptic connection is, is like a, a, a new skill, we'll call it. 400 times. And I guarantee the mom sitting there who's watching the screen now is like, Amanda, it's not 400 times. It's 500 times to to learn this new skill of of how to brush our teeth or how to do whatever. When we make it into play and we involve laughter and we involve fun, it only takes 12 to 20 repetitions. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's how. Yeah. That is like amazing to me. I'm like, wow. I could have saved myself a whole lot of energy years ago. Yeah. So we want to make things into a game. And I know there's going to be someone out there on the internet or wherever saying, Amanda, life's not a game. And you're right. Life is not always a game. I hope it is for you. I hope life is always, like, this is a fun thing that I get to do right now. Johanna, I know you love your job. Life is probably at some, most times a fun game, but there are times when it's not, right? Amanda, eventually, Someone's going to ask him to do something and he's just got to do it. And you're right. You're a hundred percent right. But guess what? In our home, I want to teach the skill and I want to have control over how I teach the skill. So when the teacher asks them, right, we'll use the basketball with laundry. They have to pop the laundry into the basketball hoop. They want to put their things away. I've done that so many times now, starting when he was a tiny little guy, that now when the teacher asks him, hey, you need to put your book away. He doesn't need to make it into a game because he knows the skill. Mm -hmm. So we can make objects talk, pretend here's here's a shoe. Help, I need to put my foot on, right? Like making it into a silly, ridiculous, I'm a crazy person game. Um, Pretending to be incompetent. Hey, where do your socks go? Oh, that's right. They go into this drawer. Thanks for helping me put them away. Offered choices. Hey, do you want to put left shoe on or right shoe on? I did it this morning as we were walking out the door. Hey, do you want to do left shoe or right shoe first? And obviously my daughter doesn't know left from right, but she'll point to a shoe, right? Giving her as much perceived power as I possibly can. Um, And on the moments when it's really, really hard, I'm going to acknowledge any, and I mean any progress. If it takes us 15,000 years to put on a shoe, it's like, great. we got one strap. I'm waiting for the other strap. Oh, it ate the other part of the shoe. Yes. All right. I wonder what the other sock wants now, right? I'm making it into a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a question now that uh, we're at the end of the slide. Um, I figured that it's, it's, it's a good time to, to ask it. My okay. toddler seems to be going through a hard time recently. She does not want to sleep on her own, which she always does, and wakes up in the middle of the night. And we do not know why that is the case after we've tried to talk to her about it. She also hits when we have explained why she cannot have her way. We've explained she cannot hit the hand uh the hand is not for hitting Mm -hmm. and she gets it most of the time but when something similar happens again she hits referring to your iceberg picture these may seem to be toddler behavior to be expected but how do we effectively find out what may be underneath the iceberg question Mm -hmm. (laughs) you may want to read it in the chat as well yeah no i can pop, pop it up too one great questions um it seems like there was kind of two in one so I'm pulling yours down so I can see it. And thank you for liking my iceberg question, my little iceberg picture. So the first one is you might not know why the two-year-old's having and night terrors. Um, so there's nightmares and there's night terrors. Night terrors can happen. It's seemingly out of nowhere. You're like, I'm trying to figure out where this even came from. They tend to happen starting at the age of two. And it might be, right, her, her body's changing so dramatically, right? They're growing at a 
ridiculous rate. And so she might not know why she's feeling upset, but she doesn't feel safe. And you know who she's calling? You, because you're her safe person. And so what we can do is we can remind her in the moment that you are safe, mom is here. I have monkey, I have whatever, whatever guys she sleeps with, or if she, if you let her sleep with guys or having a soft blanket, maybe if you let her sleep, whatever you might let her sleep with, um, you are safe. I am here. A two-year-old understand, I'm living it. I can tell you even an 18 month old understands safe. Even I would say a year old can understand the word safe and not safe. I always also want to be talking in positive. So I don't want to say hands are not for hitting because until the age of two, kids actually can't process negatives. So a statement like, don't hit your brother. The words they hear is hit and brother. <laughs> so, and I, I, it's a, it's a small change, but it makes a huge, huge difference. So, and I've had to practice that skill because my initial reaction is like, no, don't, but it's like, oh, they don't understand that. I'm going to say gentle bodies. And I'm going to say things like you're safe, not the, you know, there's no monsters under your bed. There's no, I'm not doing any of that. I'm saying, we don't know the answer. And with a two-year-old, we might we might not know the answer because she might he or she might not be able to articulate themselves, but we can remind them that they are safe. I am here. Then it might means that you are, are again like bringing your chest to their chest and you're taking deep breaths to calm your body down, even though it's three in the morning and you've got a seven a.m. call and you're exhausted. The quicker I calm my body down, the quicker I can calm their body down. So again, I'm because of mirror neurons, right? We know we can calm ourselves down. We have the ability and I have the control to do it, even though I'm so exhausted at three in the morning and my brain's not totally awake. I'm going to try to calm my body down and remind her that she is safe. And then like during the day, right during lunch, breakfast, lunch, maybe you're reminding her, oh, your room is so safe. I might play in her room extra that day to remind her room and remind her that her room is safe and that she can carry around her guy in the house because he is safe. So I'm being proactive for tonight or the next night or the next night. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Um, we only have five minutes left. Can you believe it? It's flown like crazy. How many slides have we got left in the presentation? I don't remember. So can I? <laughs> okay. I'm going to be honest with myself. Let's look. Here we go. Oh, I got to get rid of all of them. Oh, easily. This is a biography. If you want to take a screenshot, actually, I think the next slide I have. There is actually a question anyway, uh, Amanda, is, is behind the step-by-step -step actions and scripts and so on, really helpful. And they were wondering, could we share that as a PDF or something in the in the WhatsApp group or for people to, who just requested? Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought on this slide, I had a group. I'm a huge reader. If you ever come to see me professionally, I probably will recommend a book to you. And I'm, if you're not a good, if you're not a reader, no worries. There's an audio for it, I'm sure. But I have a bunch of books that I always recommend. And now I can't get to the next slide, a little stinker. Um, um, Johanna, could I give you a list of books I recommend? Um, I don't get money for this. I just, I love reading. And I, I think if we can help people, I like to help people. Um, yeah. That's, okay. we, can, we can put it on our community Facebook page and anybody of the moms or dads on the on this call as well, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can forward it to you. Easy. That is great. Um, I'm looking right here. Oh, that was. Oh, here it is. Yay. Here we go. I'm going to slide show it again. Boom. Everybody take a slide. Take a picture of this. These are great books. Oh, can you see? I can't, uh, I can't see it. I just did it to myself. My apologies. My goodness, I'm losing my mind here. Here we go. Let me go back to this. Let me go back to your Zoom. Thanks, friends, for your patience. Great. I'm going to share. And I'm going to share. Right. Yay. All right. So here are a bunch of books. I have like a thousand other books. Don't get me started on the reading you can do. I would say if you're going to, you're like, this is way too many. I feel overwhelmed. This is a book you should go get. It's at our library. I've ordered it. I've, I've got it for free at our library. Or if you want to buy it, you do you. How, and if you have little kids, get the little kid version, but how to talk so little kids will listen and how to listen. So how to talk so little kids will listen and how to listen so little kids will talk. Yeah. Um, it's an older book, but it's great. And you can pick it up like on a whim. It's not like it's like, I have to sit, this is like a textbook I have to read. It's all little snippets of stories and it's just great verbiage. Um, I don't even know. I don't know the authors. I'm not getting paid to do it. I, I know this is a good book. I use it on my kids. I probably have read it in the, the 
12 or whatever years I've been doing this, I've probably read this book five times, just in different seasons of like, whether it was for a client or whether it was for Amanda. Um, and it just is a good reminder or buffer of, of kind of um, things to just think about as a, as a mom or a, a parent, mom or dad, a parent. Amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I'm so grateful that you spent this morning with us. I'd like you to, I'd like to close by asking you to tell people how they could get in touch and where they can find you and where you practice. If you wouldn't mind stopping your screen share. Yes, I will. Two questions uh, that came in earlier. And I think what we'll do is Amanda, if you wouldn't mind to reply personally and I'll forward it to these moms. Easy. For I sure. Then do it now because they were quite complex questions as well. Yeah, of course. Happy, happy to. Um, so again, I'm Amanda Sheroff at Let's Thrive Therapy. You can find me on Instagram, Let's Thrive Therapy, just all one word. Um, mm -hmm. I am located in River Valley at the Valley Point Shopping Center. Um, and um, I'm, I'm housed within um, the Integrative Medical Center. Um, there's a great group of us here and we all specialize in different things. I'm the, the psychology person here. Um, you can email me, you can Google Let's Thrive Therapy um, and you can find my website. And I I usually try to respond within 24 hours to emails. Um, you can also WhatsApp me too. Um, I always will do a free 15 minute phone conversation. It's quick, it's easy. It's just on the phone, just to see if we're a good fit. I wanna make sure I'm meeting your needs, but I also wanna share with you what I offer. So I want you to share what you off, what you want or looking for, and I can share what I offer. Um, and I do that to save you time, to save me time and to save obviously you money. Um, because I think having that therapeutic relationship is really the cornerstone of therapy. Um, and uh, it's important that it's a good fit. And if it's not a good fit, I'll help you find someone that is a good fit. Because um, as much as it's an interview for, for you to interview me, it's in, for me to, you know, if you come to me and you say, I have this problem, and I say, actually, no, I don't specialize in that. I specialize in anxiety, relationships, um, and women's life, you know, and life transitions. Um, but I know somebody actually who's great with Da, 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 da. I'm happy to refer because I never want anybody to um, to be waiting to get mental health help. Also, just to um, as like a caveat of um, in America, everyone and their cousin has a therapist and everybody talks about their therapist. Like, oh, I go see Barbara. See, that it's becoming more of a thing here, which I'm so grateful for that you are an amazing human mom out there. You're doing a great job. Um, and just because you go to therapy doesn't mean that you're not. It just means you get extra help and it, it can be a really, I promise I try to make it fun. We do a lot of laughing. We definitely do some crying and it's a, it's a fun, exp I try to make it a fun thing. So it's a get to, not a have to. Yeah, I think so. There's a, a lot of stigma around, you know, going to a shrink as they call it. I'm not a shrink. Definitely not a shrink. Yeah. There's a lot of laughing. That's for sure that happens. And we have a good time in here. Yeah, absolutely. And we should be asking for help. It's, it's such a tough uh, journey. Motherhood is, um, and everything changes. Oh. Uh, every month you know with our relationship changing with our kids growing and so on um it's it's just good to have a professional to to help us as well and to walk alongside i'm a huge advocate of that yeah thanks johanna that's a good not perhaps to how to sort out the mess i made this morning by not going live in the right place but we'll all be um i'll be sending out links and so on and i'll be asking you for your details as well so i can share those and um, we had, I think, at, at 1.35 people on the call. So that was just amazing. I'm really glad for this turnout. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you for all the moms who joined us. Thank you yeah. for your questions. They're really amazing. And I hope you all have a lovely day. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.